village immediate. So I'm excited about this because it's an opportunity to get the gospel into each home. Whether that translates to people coming to our church is another story. The main focus and purpose of it is for evangelism. It's to present Jesus Christ uh, to uh, our community that needs to know and understand uh, the, the call of the gospel on their life. So I'm excited about this uh, initiative. It's all paid for. It's all bought and paid for. And so it's, uh, it was just, I just signed up for it. They sent me the materials. They sent me the, the organizing maps and everything else. And, uh, and it's just a matter of coordinating teams to be able to go out two by two. We don't send anybody out alone, but two by two. And, um, and we, we have the opportunity to minister. So two aspects to this. Uh, as I said before, uh, I'm hoping, I'm trusting. Um, my prayer is that each and every one of us get involved in some way in this, uh, in this process. Uh, one would be to help continue to stuff those bags and make sure that they're fully uh, ready to be distributed. The second way would actually to be a part of one of the teams that goes out. And typically it'll be on a Saturday morning, but it could also be on a Thursday after the, the noon prayer time. Uh, it could be Sunday after the service. Uh, and you just go out for a half an hour or 45 minutes and distribute. And then you just report back to us as far as what homes were covered so that we don't duplicate with the next team that goes out. Uh, it's all very organized. It's all uh, very clear and understandable. Um, and, and as you saw in the video, the thing that, that I thought was um, interesting was the opportunity to actually not just hang it on the doorknob, but if somebody's out in their home, it's not, it's not ringing doorbells and getting people to respond. It's just hanging a bag. But if they're out in front or if they're, they're involved in doing something on that day that you're there, to engage them in conversation. And, uh, and to say, hey, I just want to give this to you. This is totally free, no obligation, um, uh, you know, and, uh, and, and just hand it over to them and have that personal contact as well. So there's, there's, there's opportunities for, for a lot of different things to happen. I'm sure that there's going to be stories, and um, it, it's, it's going to be great. You know, take your pet along. You know, that's always a good way to kind of, you know, work your way into it as well. So that, that would be an awesome thing. Put a leash on your kid. I don't know. Maybe that would be something too. I'm not sure. But um, uh, borrow a child. I, you know, some parents have several kids, so we could do that as well. All right. Um, that as well as the health and wellness fair. Those are the two big initiatives that are coming up in our spring. The health and wellness fair is in April. You'll be hearing more about that, and uh, we're excited to be a part of that as well. Uh, if you open your Bibles, please, to John chapter 12. John chapter 12. We're starting in verse 9 today with our study. <clears throat> and this has been a progressive study. We've been uh, working our way through the Gospel of John, and uh, we're getting into some really exciting parts and pieces of this gospel. We've, we've been in, in some things that have just been incredible. God speaking to our hearts uh, today, I don't think will be any different. God's word is alive and it's active and, uh, and it penetrates. It goes right to the bone as the word of God says and it has that capability. So uh, let's pray and just ask that uh, we would have hearts and minds open to hear what God has for us this morning. Father God, we, we honor and bless your name. We thank you, Father, for the time that we've been able to enter into already this morning. All of this, Lord, so far being preparation for this time, this moment in your word. And so, Father, guide us and protect our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Help us to hear from you. Help us, Father, to give our full attention to your Holy Spirit at work in our lives. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. By the way, I did want to mention, um, several people have noticed already this morning that I took the banner down in the front of the church. 
Um, that was simply because it had been beaten up in a, in a windstorm, and so it was literally shredding. And I didn't want to have something that just looked cruddy up there. And so I removed it, not because of the other issue that I spoke of last week. I just simply removed it because uh, we need to replace it with a fresh one. So I just wanted to, to fill you in on that as well. Verse 9. <clears throat> I'd like for you this morning to just kind of pay attention to the, to the moments or the, or the times where, it, where the, the passage talks about a large crowd or a crowd of people or a multitude. All right, so just, just keep, be, be aware of when those times come up in our passage this morning. I, th I think those are the things that, uh, that I'd like to point out later on in the message. Um, so I, I'm just going to uh, read down through uh, to verse 19, starting in verse 9, if you'd follow along. When the large crowd of the Jews learned that Jesus was there, they came not only on account of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to put Lazarus to death as well, because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. The next day, the large crowd that had come to the fe feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it was written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples didn't understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they heard he had done this sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, you see that you are gathering, that, I'm sorry, you see that you are gaining nothing. Look, the world or the crowd has gone after him. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. You have said it, you, you have heard it said that one lie leads to another. One lie leads to another, and then another. And maybe you remember your parents saying it to you as a warning, or, or maybe you said it to your child. Maybe it's something that, that you're struggling with right now. Sometimes lies lead, the, the, sometimes lies lead to actually believing the lie. I remember one time when my mom had caught me in a lie. And I was saying, no, mom, but no, no, that's not, that's not the way it was. And I, and I actually got into it very passionately and, and actually was, I, it kind of shocked me as I looked at it later as I walked away and I got away with what I had tried to get away with. And, um, and I, I was shocked. I literally remember that as if it was yesterday, just as I was a, a teenager uh, looking to try to get my own way, that I was actually believing the lie that I told. When that happens, I believe that that crosses over into a deception. And that goes deeper and further. And you've lost the ability to discern between the truth and the lie. I've encountered people where that's the case, and they've lied for so long that they've replaced the truth with a lie and believe every bit of it as if it were true, creating pain and distrust all around them. To counter this, the lie has to be identified and replaced with truth, the truth of God's word. 
Dr. Neil Anderson has done a lot of study and coursework, if you've ever heard of the Steps to Freedom. It's his way of being able to identify the lies that we believe and then replace those lies with truth, the truth of God's Word. And it's a, a tremendous counseling uh, uh, tool that counselors will often use. On the other hand, refusing to lie brings trust and confidence even in difficult situations. It's hard when truth is the only thing that, um, that is called for in that situation, but yet it, was, it would be very hard to be able to declare that truth. My, my son Doug, as a teenager, had his difficult share of difficult situations uh, throughout his, his teenage years, and he found himself, you know, in a particular situation due to his choices. And, and when I challenged him during one of those times, I wasn't believing him. I just, I, I had my doubts, and I just, I just kept challenging him, and he frustrated. He finally says, really, Dad, I'm telling you the truth, and I flash back immediately to my time standing before my mom, and I wasn't going to have it. But then he said something to me that changed everything. It changed the moment. It changed the future as far as dealing with him as a parent. He says, you don't understand. I can't lie. And the intensity that he said it, I believed him in that moment. He was under the conviction personally, even though he was going through situations and you know difficulties as a teenager, but he had gotten to a place where he had tried, but he had decided, I can't. That's something I can't do. I can't deal with the guilt. I can't deal with the ramifications of it. I can't deal with trying to keep up with the lie in order to keep it perpetuated. I, I can't. I can't lie. And so it was a turning point in our relationship. I don't know if you've seen the movie Liar Liar with Jim Carrey in it. I actually tried to find a video clip that I could use for this morning, but there is none. Okay, and uh, sorry, but um, but the premise is that he's a He's a lawyer in a big-time firm, and he suddenly couldn't lie. And of course, with his over-dramatizations of every situation imaginable, it's, uh, it's quite humorous. Maybe you've been in a situation that if you told the truth, it wouldn't go well with you. Uh, the, the classic one is answering a question like, does this dress make me look fat? Yeah, tough situation right there. That's a hard one. Or how about, how did you like dinner tonight? Weren't those Brussels sprouts good? Mm, yeah, some of you are saying, yeah, sure, that's great. But in our passage this morning, the Jewish leaders were in a situation. They knew that there was something special about Jesus. They knew it. They recognized it. They weren't blind to it. He had uh, the miracles that he did, the raising of Lazarus from the dead. I mean, you can't overlook something like that and just dismiss it. But they were in a situation because they were in a quandary as to what to do. You know, how do we manage this? Because he's taking the people away. He's, he's con very convincing in what he's doing with his actions and his miracles, but he's destroying the people's trust in our leadership. This is what the Jewish leaders are struggling with. He's leading them away from the, transi uh, from the, from the traditions of our day, from the, from the teachings that we have been involved with uh, all of these decades, and, and away from their dependency on us. So the religious leaders are seeing this, this movement of Jesus that was just taking over the crowds. And suddenly, 
they felt like he had to be stopped because he's convincing everybody. And if he was who he said he was, that would change everything. The situation called for action. He had to be stopped. You can see the logic and the building of one lie upon another lie, justifying their actions. They believed what they believed, otherwise they would have to agree with Jesus. So deception crept in and polluted their minds, leading them down a very slippery slope, which became impossible to climb back up. That's how it happens, isn't it? You could almost put yourself in their shoes and understand where they're, I'm not trying to justify them, I'm just helping us to understand that so often we can take the, the victorious side of Jesus, knowing the story. But I think it's important for us to be able to actually get into the minds of the people that are involved, the players in this important scene. The scene is Jesus coming to the Passover celebration in the capital city of Jerusalem in John 12 and verse 9. And when, when the Jews uh, had learned that Jesus was there, they, they flocked to him and they wanted to, to see Lazarus as well because they were both together. They had a, an expectation with all that they had heard about Jesus. These are the Jews that have come from all different parts of uh, that area, in, not only in Israel, but, but other countries as well as they migrated uh, to Jerusalem. And this was the buzz that was going on. Where's Jesus? Have you seen him? Is Lazarus with him? I believe they're, they're together. I, I've got to see this. They wanted to see the man that had been raised from the dead. It's not every day that you get a chance to see that. And on account of Lazarus's testimony and witness, as well as the other people that were there that witnessed the rise, raising of Lazarus, there was a tremendous witness going out, and many were believing in Jesus, the word says. I mean, no doubt, right? Jesus and Lazarus together, the miracle worker and the miracle, that's the total package. It was too good to be true. They had to see this for themselves. And the Jewish leaders were losing control of the most significant festival of the year. All attention was on Jesus and Lazarus. But notice, it's all about what the crowd wants. Don't always follow the crowd. Popular belief. How society has begun to, to weave uh, a definite direction that things are going. The underlying story here is the crowds can be wrong. Popular opinion is overrated, especially when it comes to the things of God. Be careful, be careful as a believer in Jesus about running with the crowd. And Jesus, Jesus wasn't making it any easier, was he? in this situation. Here he comes riding on a donkey into the city in a parade with everybody shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. And he was riding the donkey and allowing all of this pomp and circumstance to happen. But we'll come back to that. The authorities needed to act and they needed to act fast. And their decision, the conclusion that they came to, kill them both. Let's rid ourselves of this insurrection, of this uprising. Let's cut it off at the head. Let's take out Jesus and Lazarus. Can you imagine the hate? The hate that had grown in their hearts, hate that brought them to the point of feeling the need to get rid of these two. They couldn't silence them. They couldn't ignore them. They couldn't tolerate them. 
the lies they believed were building the case for their actions. And what they were to do next took them further down that slippery slope. That's the setting of today's passage. But I don't want to dwell so much on the religious leaders. We'll kind of put that aside for now. I really want to dwell on, on Jesus. Notice in verse 12, Jesus coming into Jerusalem for the Passover feast, the party that broke out spontaneously. This wasn't anything that was organized. This was just the crowd's response to Jesus coming into town. And it was with palm branches and a parade. And that's where I want to kind of rest for the rest of this message. I want to kind of spend some time here because I don't know how many people were in attendance that day in Jerusalem. Um, but it was a solemn obligation for every Jew to attend the festival and the Passover time in Jerusalem. Since the days of just King Josiah, uh, the people were not permitted to celebrate Passover in their hometowns, but were called to go to the sanctuary in Jerusalem to keep the feast. So it was a migration. It were the, the Jews, if they were practicing Jews, would, would collectively get up and make this trip, however many days it took them to get there. And um, Josephus, a Jewish historian, estimated that uh, attendance at the Passover uh, w would have been somewhere around 2.7 million Jews. And so it's safe to say that in the holy city that day, when Jesus was coming in on the donkey, that there were two million guests with about a half a million residents in Jerusalem itself. So if you kind of can imagine that kind of crowd, I mean, we've had million man marches, We've had gatherings in our nation's capital. We've had all sorts of different things in New York City. Nothing really compares to what we're looking at here as far as several million Jews coming together. So I'd like to point out three significant things about this parade. All right, one is the palm branches. The second thing is the chant that they use. And the third, Jesus choosing to ride a donkey. I'd like to bring out those three things. Why, first of all, palm branches? What's the significance of the palm branch? Well, during the intertestamental period, the 400 years of silence between the Old and the New Testament, there was an event that took place that I've actually spoken of before as it's been referenced in the Gospel of John. And it was the event where foreigners had come in and overthrown Jerusalem and had gone in and desecrated the temple. They had done things in the temple that completely desecrated it in regards to the Mosaic law and how the temple worship was to be held. And an uprising of Jews uh, led by a particular man was came about and they were they were determined to get these foreigners out and um, and they did so and they drove the foreigners out and a celebration broke out and it became known as the feast of dedication or the feast of lights we've talked about it before and this is our modern day Hanukkah and they rededicated the temple to the service of God due to this victory a parade ensued a victory parade, a celebration, something like a ticker tape parade in New York City. And it was celebrated with music and with the waving of palm branches. And at that point in Jewish history, the palm branch became a sign and symbol of military victory. It was a military triumph as these foreigners were driven out of Jerusalem. Later, the Jews began minting coins with the image of palm branches on it because it had become their national symbol of victory. 
So palm branches became a, a, an indication of military strength, power, victory, um, and overcoming great challenges. So when Jesus came riding into town, the people, the crowd, waved palm branches and cried out in victory for their king. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. Number two, the chant or the cry that they use. Hosanna. It literally means, translated, save now. Save now. They would cry out Hosanna, and that's what they were declaring. Save now. Both this and the saying, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, are actually found in uh, the Psalms, in a series of readings between Psalm 113 and Psalm 118, it's, it's called the Halal. And the Halal was traditionally sung every morning during the Feast of Tabernacles in every Jewish home. It was scripture memorized, put to song, and they would literally sing uh, these portions of scripture as they celebrated the Feast of Tabernacles. And I'd like to read a section of Psalm 118 to you and see if you pick up some of these references uh, it within the psalm. It's verses 19 to 26 of Psalm 118, if you want to follow along. Open to me the gates of righteousness. I will go through them. I will praise the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous shall enter. I will praise you, for you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. That's speaking of Jesus. It was the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Save now. In other words, Hosanna. I pray, O Lord, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. So as these Jews have come together, it just wasn't some random chant that they started. This was something that every Jewish participant in this parade coming into Jerusalem, they knew what they were chanting. And adding King of Israel showed that the people wanted, the people wanted Jesus to save them. Save them in a military sense. Save them to overthrow Rome and to reclaim sole possession of Jerusalem once again. But yet, in just a few short days, this same multitude is chanting crucifying. Crucifying. All according to God's purpose. Now what about the donkey? This is strange because Jesus was being welcomed as a victorious king. However, kings used to ride in on royal steeds, not a donkey. Donkeys were much smaller than a horse. So even back then, uh, they were smaller than what we have as donkeys in our country because they've been bred to be stronger and, and larger here in, in America. But back in that day, no grown man would be able to ride a donkey without having to bend his knees so his feet didn't drag. That's typical for me when I ride a horse, but nevertheless, it's, uh, you know, everybody would be having to be concerned about keeping their feet high enough. And the donkey that Jesus rode was even smaller than this because it was a colt. It was a young donkey. Jesus rode in this victorious parade on a small, lowly donkey, fulfilling the prophecy that's found in Zechariah chapter 9. 
Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he. Humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem and the battle bow shall be cut off and he shall speak peace to the nations. His rule shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. This isn't the picture that the crowds had of the Messiah that they were looking for and praying for. They wanted someone to ride into town on a war horse and drive out the Romans. But Jesus, Jesus identified as the, he identified with God's version of the Messiah. The Messiah who had come in lowliness being born into a stable using a manger as a crib. And now, riding in in the lowliness and meekness and humility of riding on a, a donkey. So what's the meaning here? Jesus didn't deny that he was the rightful king of the Jews, but he let them know that he was the king God wanted him to be not the king to meet the people's expectations. When we come to Jesus with our agendas, giving him our demands, we too can be left very disappointed and angry and sometimes bitter when he doesn't do the things that we want him to do. But nevertheless, he still comes. The king still comes. When you don't understand what God is doing, your king is coming. If you're feeling beat down by life and circumstances, your king is coming. If you're feeling defeated, your king is coming. If you're feeling confused about his timing, your king is coming. When life overwhelms you, your king is coming. When darkness surrounds you and you can't find your way, your king is coming. When nothing seems to be working, your king is coming. When illness or disease cover you like a cloud, your king is coming. When hope is gone and you're about to give up, your king is coming. This is the promise of God. These aren't my words. This is God saying, your king is coming. It's the light in the darkness. It's the truth of the gospel. It's the message of all scripture. From the table of contents to the maps, as they say. The word of God declares the king is coming. Your king is coming. Don't forget it. Don't throw in the towel too soon. Don't begin down the slippery slope of doubt and unbelief. Why? Because your king is coming. He's coming. Humbly. He's coming meekly. But he's coming, and all of hell can't stand against him. Let's pray. Father, you are so good. Your mercy endures forever. And Father, you never look away. You never just ignore. You never desire wrong or bad for us. Father, you have provided for us. You have sustained us. You have
protected us. You continue, Father, to, to be on our guard and our strong tower. Father, you, you desire, Lord, that, uh, that we would be faithful in following after you, even through the hard times. Why? Because you're sending Jesus. Father, in a day when there's confusion, in this day when there is so much trouble and, uh, and so much turmoil, and right seems wrong and wrong seems right, Father, we know that your king is coming. The king that you have decided. Father, that, uh, that your timing is perfect, that your will is, is all that we need. And Father, help us to be encouraged by that. Help us to recognize, Father, that our king, the Lord Jesus Christ, is coming. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please stand as we conclude our service.